Awesome. Mm -hmm. Dr. Scott, thank you so much for giving me the opportunity to speak with you today and answering all the Arabian Stargazer questions. We're very excited to have you here. We can start asking questions or whatever you like. Oh, well, I'm so excited to be with you, Dana. This is this can be a lot of fun for me. Um, and you know, I'm so uh, excited by what you're doing with the Arabian Stargazer. You know, my, my personal background, I, I grew up living overseas, including uh, spending uh, some time in uh, Beirut, Lebanon, and also uh, spent some time in high school in Tehran, Iran. So I traveled widely through the Middle East as a kid. I, I did track meets in Cairo, Egypt every year through high school. So, uh, yeah, it's kind of neat to uh, come full circle now and, and uh, be able to support uh, uh, your really cool uh, vlog. Thank you so much. Thank you very much. I lived very shortly in Lebanon, too. It's a very nice, gorgeous city. Yeah. And, um, and I'm glad that you, you, would, you kind of know the type of culture that I come from and everybody who asks these questions. So this is going to sure. create like a very unique interview. Mm -hmm. So cool. start with the questions that they asked. I have a lot of questions, so I'm going to pick a few of the most trending questions. The first one was, um, why did you want to go to space? What was your purpose? What made you love space? Did you want to be an astronaut as a kid? You know, ever since I was, uh, you know, uh, I could walk and talk, quite honestly, I wanted to be an astronaut. My father worked on the Apollo program when I was very young, so I had model rockets and, and posters on the wall. In fact, I have a few of them here in my background. I don't know if you can you can see uh, that, that's uh, awesome <laughs> but uh, um, but uh, I uh, grew up in and around the space program I, I every kid on the block when I was a kid wanted to be an astronaut but I just never grew out of it and so I wanted to be actually the very first to set boot prints down on Mars it didn't quite work out that way for me in my career but maybe some of your viewers will be you know the very first Martians uh, I, very, I, I very much hope so. <laughs> I, I, I believe the very first Martians have already been born. They may be working for Virgin Orbit or uh, <laughs> maybe grad school or, or maybe even in elementary school. Who knows? But uh, yeah. they're, they're alive and they're preparing for their exciting careers too. Maybe one day I'll be an astronaut. I'm not yeah. working towards that. Maybe that would happen one day. <laughs> sure, sure. Definitely. Awesome. And the second question was, which was the most asked question probably every single viewer asked. What did you feel when you first arrived in space? And did you miss Earth? Did you feel lonely? What, what was the feeling when you left the ground and you were in that you know, darkness in space? It's so, it's so exhilarating to leave the planet uh, on a rocket ship. It's, a, you know, it's an otherworldly experience, the, the sense of acceleration, the, the power that you feel to to break the surly bonds of Earth to get into Earth orbit. Uh, but once you're there, you have this you know, rarefied view of your home planet. You just can't believe that you're there. Um, you know, we, we think of our home planet as having uh, boundaries. We see a globe spinning on a, you know, on a table with dots to, to indicate cities, but it's just a confluence of humanity and nature. And, uh, you know, the, the contrast between a beautiful blue planet and the enormity of the universe, uh, with trillions and trillions of stars out there, it's just, it's unbelievable. There, are, there aren't words in the English language to do it justice. Maybe there are in Arabic, I don't know. <laughs> but uh, it's, it's such a profound uh, uh, life experience. And, and so for me, I was just uh, so excited to be there. I was nervous the first time I went because I, I wanted to feel well, I wanted to perform well. And I, was, I knew that uh, a lot of money had gone into training me to perform scientific experiments and to operate the space shuttle. And so I wanted to do my very best. But a couple of days into the flight, I realized, hey, and I'm, I'm doing really well up here. I feel great. And I'm in this amazing environment. And uh, so I never felt lonely or homesick, but I, I did really want to get uh, back home to, uh, to tell everyone about this amazing experience, to be able to share the story. And what I think is so exciting about this day and age is that there are companies like Virgin Galactic, like SpaceX, Blue Origin, and others that will be taking many more people up into space and allowing them to experience what I've experienced. And it's a life-changing, uh, wonderful experience. That's so amazing. I have goosebumps all over me. I, yeah. I, leave, I leave a city and a country on an airplane, and I feel that tremendous feeling, let alone leaving an entire planet or just going somewhere that very very few people in the world so this is this is really exciting thank you for sharing that with us yeah, yeah. actually somebody asked uh, and and they said will humans ever colonize uh, other planets and they also asked 
they are traveling to space was impossible. Is there something impossible for humans to do this after recent de development? And I immediately thought of Virgin Galactic. Virgin Galactic is making space so it's not very affordable right now, but it's making it affordable for regular human beings to go and experience space. What do you think about that? I, I'm so excited by what Virgin is doing in Blue Origin and and uh, of course, you know, there's so many wonderful uh, things happening in commercial space flight now. Just uh, a week or two ago, uh, the second Virgin Galactic flight, including yeah. uh, some friends of mine and uh, 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 Beth Moses, uh, became the first commercial uh, you know, female astronaut uh, uh, to fly in space. And um, uh, Mark Stuckey and, uh, and CJ uh, flew in an earlier flight, a suborbital flight. Um, Blue Origin is about to fly. Um, their you know, suborbital flights, SpaceX just had a very successful unmanned uh, docking to the International Space Station. So, you know, we're right on the forefront. It's sort of the, uh, the barnstorming era of the commercial human space flight. And I firmly believe that in the not too distant future, people will be able to board a space plane uh, there in Los Angeles or here in Houston and be a half a world away in just 50 minutes or something. You know, all of the planet will become astronauts and it will change change everything it's going to Definitely. be so yeah I, I feel very i feel the surreal feeling that we live and i'm alive at a time where somebody can call themselves a, a future astronaut and mm -hmm. they don't have this rigorous training that every astronaut like yourself had to go through and it can be like space tourism i've read that in the 1960s like, magazines mm -hmm. russian yeah. magazines saying like oh do we have flying spaceships technically we do and the, all these companies that we're I'm working with with a company that has a sister company who's taking humans to other you know to to other um, destinations that we haven't even experienced before so I'm glad that I live in a, in a time where this is possible it is an exciting time to be alive and you know with all the the political uncertainties that we deal with you know, I'm a technologist, and I'm I'm so excited about the the wonderful things that technology is bringing to bear. I try not to think too much about politics, <laughs> and craziness that's happening in our world. But uh, you know, uh, you know, getting back to what you were just saying there, I don't know that the future astronauts will need to have all the the training that I had. You know, in fact, one of the exciting things about Virgin Galactic is it's a three day training flow. You 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 arrive, you. Uh, um, just need to know what uh, what to do in an emergency, and you strap in, and you're there to enjoy it. And um, yeah. so the, the the barriers to entry, the, the rigorous training um, that I had to go through won't be necessary for those in the future, and that's great. That is great. I, I definitely respect yeah. Richard Branson's mission to make mm -hmm. space just a normal thing. It's not like space. Right. Definitely. Yeah. yeah. Awesome. Cool. Um, a third question was, uh, what are some life lessons that you learned as an astronaut? Well, preparedness, you know, so uh, it was preparedness and tenacity. Those are the things that have suited me so well through life. And actually it happened, uh, I, I derived these life lessons as a as boy um, through uh, the Boy Scouts, actually, believe it or not. Um, the, the, uh, the setting of long, faraway goals is exciting and and uh, when you, you start to start um, you know, daydreaming about them but when you break it down it's it's really daunting uh, thinking well I, I want to become a physician or I want to become an astronaut and it's easy to get discouraged and what the Boy Scouts actually taught me is that if you break down a, a lofty goal into manageable piece parts and in Boy Scouts it's kind of easy it's all these merit badges that you need to do and service projects and if you could uh, break down a lofty goal into manageable piece parts that you can have successes along the way, um, you don't get discouraged. You know, you, you see yourself continue to make progress towards that faraway goal. And, uh, and so this is something that I've applied throughout the course of my life, uh, whether it's as a, um, a medical student uh, and, or now today as a tech startup CEO, um, being able to dissect the, uh, the lofty goal into manageable piece parts and to uh, derive successes and reinforce myself along that pathway. That's awesome. It, it teaches you that failure is an option. And um, well, for, for space, 
I'm sure there are some instances where you do fail, but it, there are redundant systems where you, you kind of account for that risk and account for that fail. And I learned that when I built a CubeSat and we put three valves instead of one. So if one yeah. doesn't open, the other one open. So this yeah. is a really good lesson to learn um, as just a human being in general. That, that's awesome, Diane. In fact, yeah, I, what you said is so, so true and profound, but the, the, the pathway to success is, uh, is you know, checkered with uh, periodic failures, and that's okay. You, you learn from failures, uh, but if you're tenacious, if you've got the long view, you keep on going. You take the the, the detour, and you keep on going. And uh, and so my my path to becoming an astronaut to doing what I'm doing now hasn't been linear, but I've kept on going, and and by and large, it's been really successful. So that's awesome. That's very inspiring. All right. Um, this question also was asked a lot, and it can kind of give you a sense of the, um, the younger generation there and the, just the Arab culture and how we, how we see success. Did anyone, um, family or friends, supported your choice? And how did that affect and support your success? Absolutely, it's a great question. And uh, I was so fortunate to have uh, supportive parents um, who, uh, they might have wished that I, uh, you know, joined the chess club or did something, <laughs> more, uh, you know, uh, grounded to earth and, and less, uh, you know, risky. But uh, they realized that I was very adventurous and I wanted to challenge myself always. So I did some things that were, you know, you know, not um, necessarily always the most, uh, um, the, the safest or the, the easiest path. But I, I enjoyed the challenge and they always supported me. What I also yeah. learned through my my pathway through life is that uh, you really need to surround yourself with people who don't knock you down, who don't tell you you can't do something. They may want to give you uh, very logical, important advice, but they won't necessarily you know, tell you, you, know, you, you there's no way in, uh, on earth you can possibly do that. Um, you want people that will be honest and direct with you, but not people that will uh, you know, put you down or tell you you can't do something. And so um, I, my parents were very wonderful in their support for me. And then I was very, uh, quite honestly, selective in the people that I hang out with. If, if people were negative, uh, they were out of my life. That's a very good advice because we get forced into this bubble that we live in. And if your type of passion is not very popular in that country or even in your community, you get discouraged and, and just try to look at alternate routes. And maybe you take the alternate route and you won't be successful because you don't love it. I mean, I personally, my parents were not very supportive from the very beginning. They're going to watch this and we'll be upset. <laughs> You know, they wanted me to wear this white coat and work in a clean lab, and I go home at a certain hour, but that was not my passion. I sucked up biology, did not want to do anything related to medicine. I loved engineering, and right now I work in, I work with hazardous operations with really big machineries, and you might hurt, but I trust my team, I trust my abilities, and I want to work in this industry because I'm very passionate about it. And when they yep. say there's very logical, methodical pathway that I'm taking, even with, with the Arabian Stargazer, they realized that I have calculated thoughts about everything that I do, and they started trusting my choices. So I want the viewers to see that too. Think about your choices, then do them. Don't go and, and just try to say, I want to do this, and you don't have, you didn't even think about what you want to do. So that's definitely a really good way to put it. Just don't surround people who will not support you. Yeah, yeah, well said. Fantastic. Um, so one of the questions, too, was how do you see the future of humankind in the search of space objects? Do you think we will find them and communicate them with other ways? And it's really funny that they said objects. It depends <laughs> on how people think about it. Yeah, no, I, I mean, that, that the question can be interpreted in so many different ways. So, yeah. you know, the, uh, the scientist engineer in me thinks, well, I, I guess they're talking about... Uh, asteroids and uh, you know, near earth asteroids and earth crossing asteroids and things of that nature. And that's very important of course. So, you know, I think um, creating uh, a network of observatories, whether earth-based or space-based telescopes that can really map the uh, orbital behaviors of these uh, space rocks that are out there that could 
pose problems to humanity. That's really important. And, and there are a number of um, organizations and companies that are looking to do that. It's not cheap to do that, but it's something that's very, very important to the longevity of our planet. Obviously, if you just look at the, the moon, look up at the night sky, you see, well, it's pockmarked with, with craters. So obviously, at least in uh, our early system, solar system evolution, there's been many uh, you know, impact events. And it's likely that uh, there will be you know, many others, even in, in Earth's future. There are um, uh, meteorites that come down on planet Earth every day. Uh, most of them not seen, but some of them are, and we, we can study those space rocks. But um, we have a lot to learn from those, uh, uh, those space rocks that, uh, um, you know, um, help us under, understand it, um, how the, the solar system formed and help us kind of plan for, for going out uh, to exploit them too. I, yeah, I get these questions all the time. It's like, there is this YouTube video that showed there's a meteor coming to Earth and it's going to destroy humanity. And <laughs> I don't think, I think the subject is very vague and um, there's a lot of things that happen in space that we don't understand unless you have a very technical background. So it's, it's very interesting that you actually um, translated that question as space objects, as, you know, rocks that might hit Earth or just random objects in, in space. Mm -hmm. and, and so there are, uh, you know, possibilities, of course, too, that uh, life exists elsewhere in the universe. And I, I personally believe that life is probably not the exception, but the rule. I believe that uh, there are conditions for life, even kind of earth uh, uh, like life forms, you know, carbon based uh, uh, life forms dependent on um, maybe photosynthesis and or the presence of water and, and energy. But you know, life might look totally different. It might be silica based, yeah. who knows what, what else it could look like. And even in our own solar system, if you look at planets like, or moons like Europa, Enceladus and Titan uh, that orbit our gas giant planets in the outer solar system. Conditions for life could exist there too. These are planets that are ice encrusted, have geothermal or other types of heat energy, and uh, maybe the Loch Ness monster, you know, exists underneath these uh, ice-covered uh, oceans. So yeah. yeah, it's really exciting things to think about. It is, yeah. It, it, in, in, like space and space objects or aliens or a life in other planet can be like bacteria. It might look like a bit, we don't know. It, it, it's not necessarily going to evolve the way humans evolve. Correct, yeah. Yep. Yeah, I, I think about it, it just the movies makes us think that aliens look like these short thing and they have <laughs> brains, but that's just movies in Hollywood. Um, so. One last personal question, one of the few last ones, is when an emergency occurs in space, how do you deal with stress and tension? Well, the way um, I've always dealt with, with stress in space is uh, by being well prepared. So um, you know, we, we train um, exhaustively to, to manage very difficult problems. And so um, whether it's out on a spacewalk, we've spent hundreds of hours underwater practicing the things we do in space, um, or in other kinds of simulations, virtual reality, what have you. And we really think through not only what we're going to be doing up in space, but uh, what, um, what might happen if something were to fail. You know, we, we need to understand not only how things are built, but how they might break, and to think through what's our plan B and plan C if, if that were to happen. And so that's, that's when you know that you're really ready to go fly uh, a space mission, when you've really kind of thought not just about what you're going to do, but um, what happens if uh, things start to break around you. Yes. And uh, so I, I was always, uh, you know, I always felt very well prepared, confident that we were going to be successful in our missions, not just because I knew uh, what I was going to do if everything went perfectly, but I knew that I was well prepared and my, my crewmates were well prepared and mission control that was looking over our shoulders was incredibly well prepared and we'd be able to, to manage it. That's good. And, and the more you fly, the more data you have to document and things that went well and didn't go well. For example, right. right now during stage testing for, for, the, for Virgin, there's a lot of preparedness that comes 
comes with the job. And the more you do testing, the more data points that you have, the more family sure. data you have that you can graph together and you know what is the possibility of something failing. So definitely failure is, is part of the training. They, they make you fail so you see how you would deal with that. Right on. Yep. True. I love how my my career is somehow related to it could just space in general teaches you to do the same protocols. <laughs> yep. Definitely. All right. So I got a um, few other questions um, that are somehow clear. Um, uh, let's see. I'm going to read this question the same exact way it was asked. Okay. <laughs> when the black holes swallow the surrounding objects, do these objects do these objects turn into separate atoms or remain coherent and retain the same body? And what is inside the black holes? Does it have another life or just vacuum and silence? Well, that's a profound astrophysical <laughs> question that no one can answer. In fact, and, yeah. and, uh, and so you know, uh, what little we that I, I know, and I think what little astrophysicists know of, of black holes, um, you know, it's a, it's a one-way trip, and so there's increasing density. Uh, even light is, is pulled into the, the core of, of a black hole. And so there is radiation that emits from the, the environment, but the event horizon, but who knows what, what's really happening there. Uh, but uh, I guess backing away from that, um, you know, all of us are, you know, hail from stardust. So we are, our molecular structure actually includes the byproducts of supernova explosions. So these incredibly dense stars that explode, um, creating higher order atoms that, uh, uh, you know, are abundant in nature. So everything around us has come from, from stardust, even though we think of, you know, just mundane earth rocks for all that, or our own bodies is, you know, just basic, uh, you know, earth, earth product, but actually we come from the stars. Yeah, I can insert a Carl Sagan quote right there. Well, <laughs> this Cosmos book. <laughs> That's awesome. Black holes are just such an exciting subject. Um, you can never talk enough about it. Um, cool. Um, some questions I got about materials. Do you predict humans will extract min uh, minerals found in space? And what type of minerals are currently explored in space? The person who asked that question said, does the space contain minerals such as uh, diamond, platinum, gold? Well, it's a great question. And so, yeah, the, the likelihood is that all those things that we, we value here on Earth, uh, your rare, uh, rare metals and so on, and, and, and gemstones, probably in some form or fashion do exist elsewhere in, uh, in the geologic evolution. Um, but, uh, but quite honestly, for, for mining in space, which is the, kind of the core of the question, I think what we'll be looking for initially is something much more mundane. If we, if we really do want to go inhabit space, colonize space, we'll be going there to get something much more um, mundane, which is water. Um, if, we, if we can find water on Mars, on the south, south pole of the moon, for example, we can break it down, we can hydrolyze it, create hydrogen, which we can do something with potentially, but oxygen, uh, very important uh, for, for breathing, uh, potentially for uh, creation of uh, types of propellants, oxidants for, for rockets. Uh, we can use the water itself to grow plants, use hydroponic um, growing technologies to sustain a uh, habitat, to, to go beyond uh, lunar orbit, for example. So uh, I, I think that the first uh, um, space miners, if you will, are going to be looking for water more than they'll be looking for yeah. you know, titanium or uh, tritium or anything like that. Yeah, because we want to find these products that would make humans in live. And, and that is that kind of energy that we look for, just the sun and air and water. So I do consider water, and scientists consider water as a material and something that we want to search for. And we've been searching for it for many, many years. So Right, right. Definitely. All right, I'm just check, uh, checkboxing all the questions that we asked. Um, this one we asked it. People asked about how do you, 
how do you feel in, in zero G? You're wearing this really gigantic spacesuits that NASA makes you guys to wear. <laughs> How, how do you feel when you're inside of that? Because it's not a regular thing that you do every day when you're not, there's no gravity. Well, so yeah, if we were inside the space shuttle or the space station, I'd be wearing a shirt like this and uh, be floating around. Uh, I wouldn't be wearing shoes because you don't, shoes are kind of useless, right? You don't yes. <laughs> tell yourself with your feet, so you're just kind of grabbing on with your hands. Um, so it's very comfortable, shirt sleeve environment inside a spacecraft. And outside on a spacewalk, um, you're in, you're actually floating inside that um, that spacesuit, so uh, it's it's really really cool. Um, that is cool. It's uh, you, know, you 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 have a bigger uh, form factor, so you, you've got this big bulky backpack on a big helmet, lights, cameras, tools on your front of your spacesuit, um, and you you through training it sort of becomes a second skin to you. You you sort of uh, adapt to it. And um, you forget that it's almost there. It's, it's really kind of crazy how with training it becomes just sort of natural to move move about in that space. But every once in a while you think about, oh my gosh, everything that I needed to sustain life inside the space shuttle or space station is now engineered around me. It's in my backpack. I've got my batteries, my oxygen cylinders, my CO2 removal, um, my radios, and all sorts of other technology. So you're in your own personal spaceship, and it's, it's really amazing. That's awesome. You can survive just wearing something. That's right. Yeah. That's really cool. And Musk is trying to build like this much neater looking uh, space suit, which is also very cool to look at. It's a very cool looking thing. Yeah. It, it, it's what we would call a, an IVA suit, which is an intravehicular suit. So it's, it would sustain life if there were a cabin pressurization, but it, it's not uh, designed for uh, going out and doing substantial work outside it would be oh, I see. a life uh, a life preserver if you will yeah one of the most difficult things that i've experienced from the space industry or just building cubesats is the weight and and amount of space you have so a small cubesat it's the most difficult thing is to build things that are so tiny to fit into that cubesat same thing with the space suit you have so much stuff that you need to install on that space suit there isn't really a possibility to make it any smaller. So that's kind of a technological um, difficulty. It, it's, a, it's a real challenge, bit, but as, a, as, a, uh, as an engineer, it's a really exciting challenge too, to, yes. to figure out ways to miniaturize technologies, to sustain life, to do important science out there in a really harsh, uh, unforgiving environment. So that's, that's why it's so cool being in the space industry. Yeah. So on that note, uh, somebody asked, what are some psychological challenges can future astronauts face on deep space missions? And does traveling to space affect astronauts' health? Wow. So those are two uh, interesting and, but very different questions. So um, I'll, I'll, there are a lot of things that happen physiologically, medically to astronauts. But I'll, I'll talk about the psychological aspects first. So um, on a space shuttle flight for two weeks in space, uh, crews uh, invariably can get along just fine. You know, there's no, no real additional effort needs to be put into crew compatibility or um, you know, that sort of thing. But when you start to think about a six-month or 12-month or two-year mission, perhaps to Mars, Cross-cultural issues, uh, psychological compatibility, those kinds of things become very, very important. And NASA and our partners have spent a lot of time looking at, you know, how do we build a uh, healthy, collaborative team? Um, we, we use the National Outdoor Leadership School, or Knowles, and send crews out on these expeditions for uh, 10 days or more to develop the, the cohesion the leadership styles that work for that particular crew. And that's, it's really important to do that. Um, it's also really important thinking about, you know, crews that come from different parts of the world, American astronauts, uh, Europeans, Russians, uh, Canadians, Japanese, and of course many other nations will join in the future. Um, of course the Chinese have a very successful program too. Um, when, when we all fly together, how do we, how do we communicate? How do we, uh, how do we deal with the, the stressors of the job? And then it, it, it's one thing to be in Earth orbit and to be able to pick up a satellite phone and call family and friends or, and browse the web and tweet. But if you're on, your, you're on a one-way trip to Mars and um, you know, it's a 21-minute 
uh, one-way transmission just to send a message, let alone get a message back, it becomes very difficult. Um, you can't just look out the window and, and have a connectedness to Earth. You're just going to look out at a black star field and you'll feel very far away. And I think the psychological challenges of that will be very significant. And I don't know what they yet in terms of how to best support the crews, but I think um, my, my, in my past, I oversaw healthcare for the United States Antarctic program. We, we did the screening and uh, medical support for uh, crew members, engineers, and scientists who went to the South Pole Station for many months, including the, the long uh, winter's night down there. And uh, it, it really can be very challenging for the people that winter over, you know, as much as nine months without any outside contact. Yeah. So uh, I think we have a lot we can learn actually from uh, the scientists who go to Antarctica. Did, so you, did you feel that yourself? Did you feel that uh, disconnect as well? I didn't. You know, my, my I, I visited Antarctica for a few weeks at a time. I, I, my, my spatial missions were no longer than 17 days in duration. So uh, I really didn't feel that disconnect. But uh, some of our um, our long duration astronaut, Scott Kelly, he spent 340 days in space. Uh, a buddy of mine. Um, you know, it, it's quite challenging on on family and friends to be you know, you know, to be away from them for that long. Yeah. So it's not but like it's, it's another country. You're somewhere yeah. else. <laughs> there, there's, there's no quick, you know, um, you know, you, you can't take a weekend off and, and, uh, yeah. you know, continue. So you, it, it's, a, it's an endurance kind of a experience for sure. You, you can't pick up the phone and FaceTime your mom. That's not very, <laughs> not very useful in space. <laughs> Well, uh, aboard the International Space Station, they, they can sort of do that. They can have video teleconferences and stay in touch. But awesome. on, a, on a Mars mission, um, it's going to be a, a totally different game, for sure. Yeah, distance is different. That's yeah. the, at the beginning of everything, it's difficult, but there is a lot of engineering that goes into our problems to make humans' life easier, which is why I really, really expect and respect engineers for that trait specifically. Yeah, no, I, I think, um, you know, thinking about optical uh, transmission of, of, uh, of data, you know, there might be a way even to Mars to be able to make the, you know, to have data uh, travel at the speed of light rather than, you know, the speed of radio waves. Uh, so that, that could be very exciting uh, for the future. You also asked about uh, healthcare and, you know, the medical challenges. So there are a lot of things that, that happen to the human body when we leave Earth's one gravity um, our muscles and bones and our heart don't have to pump against gravity. We don't have to resist yes. gravity. They atrophy. Uh, you know, we, we get weaker when we're in space. And so we developed a really successful exercise kind of measure to, to stay healthy up in space. Um, the big unknowns, the big challenges that we still have, though, are with respect to radiation. When we're outside of Earth's magnetic fields, we're at much more susceptible to galactic cosmic radiation and it's called coronal mass ejections from the sun, but lots and lots of radiation could very quickly uh, prove fatal even. We could have acute radiation poisoning on a, on a trip to Mars. So we have to think of different shielding strategies and maybe different rocket technologies to get to Mars more quickly, as opposed to a chemical rocket, which could take as much as you know, nine months on a one-way trip. So there are other strategies to get astronauts there quickly. Uh, one's called the, the Vazimir. It's a plasma ion engine that could get a uh, crew there in, you know, perhaps a couple of months' time. So all the uh, all the doctors that follow me will really enjoy this answer because one of the most one of the most traditional uh, job that we have in the Middle East is being a doctor. So right, right, yeah. very interested in that answer. <laughs> That's awesome. I'm sure a doctor asked this. <laughs> um, did you enjoy the food and the smell of Earth, is, uh, of uh, space? Was it something different than what you experienced here? Yeah, so there, there is a unique smell uh, when we first open up uh, an airlock hatch or just an, uh, an enclosure that has just been exposed to the, way, uh, the vacuum of space. It's sort of like a, a burnt ozone uh, sort of uh, really unique kind of uh, odor, uh, mm -hmm. unlike any, you know, pretty much anything here on Earth. Um, so the, there is something unique uh, to that. Um, 
it's not unpleasant. It's, it's not, it's not a rose either. You know, it's a, yeah. <laughs> just, it's, it's its own thing. Yes. So it's yeah. like when, when you're there, would you know that you're in space? Do yes. You know yeah. Smell? yeah, no, it would take me right back. Yeah. That's awesome. That's yeah. awesome. What about the food? The food is fantastic. I, I think it doesn't look very appealing. So we use a lot of um, dehydrated food. Uh, yeah. So we have excess water as a byproduct of our fuel cells and and uh, and recycling of water up aboard the International Space Station. So we can, it's, it's much more cost effective to, to dehydrate food, send it up, and then we add water back into it, hot or cold, and, uh, and then once it's reconstituted, then we can eat it. So it tastes fantastic. We, we have great uh, dietitians and chefs that prepare That's meals. That's so cool. <laughs> it looks kind of gross, actually. It's, uh, yeah. So uh, the other, what's the, what's some of the worst? Um, some of the worst. <laughs> uh, <laughs> broccoli au gratin, which is yeah, broccoli with cheese. We used to call that broccoli au rotten. But it just <laughs> oh, right. uh, really nasty. Uh, uh, but you, you add um, you know, six ounces of hot water, let it sit, sit for a few minutes, and it's really fantastic. Uh, macaroni and cheese, Yum. I never eat it on earth, but up in space, it's fantastic. Yeah. Um, shrimp cocktail with horseradish sauce, fantastic. Because we, we have a, a fluid shift that happens when we go up into space. And um, so we kind of get a puffy face and um and a mild headache and our taste buds are impacted in some way so uh uh we tend to like spicier foods up in space and so oh, that's, that's horseradish sauce is really good you have a really good menu i want to <laughs> food they sell it somewhere i'm sure if in a museum of yeah probably yeah. yeah so i'm going to end this uh with with two questions that was it was miscellaneous but i think it would be the most important answers uh for oh. Arabian starting. Okay. Yeah. What are the best majors to study to pursue a career in space? Uh, well, there's, there's no one unique answer uh, for that question. It's a great question, but what I would tell any uh, young person, you know, wanting to get involved in the space program is follow your passion. Things that you're passionate about, you're succeed in. So, you know, if you're, if you're interested in uh, mechanical or electrical engineering, Go for it. If you're interested in astrophysics or medicine or uh, material science, go for it. If you, if you do that, you're going to be really good at what you do. And those are all fields that we need, of course, to, uh, to advance our, our toehold in space, to make it accessible for more people, to colonize uh, the moon and Mars in the future. So um, do things that you really enjoy. Uh, in the space program, we need People who are well versed in math and science and in medicine is also a wonderful background as well. But uh, uh, don't try and force fit yourself into something that isn't something you're genuinely interested in uh, because it'll it'll show. Yeah, and it just space is very versatile. One of the Brooke Owens fellows is actually a physicist, but she calls herself the dancing physicist because she she her entire uh, senior project was understanding how human's body change when you're dancing in space. Mm -hmm. What if you want to do a dancing concert in space? How would that be? So I think it, space is very versatile, which is awesome. Uh, that's, that's really cool. You know, I love the Brook Owens uh, Fellowship Program. Uh, obviously, you do as well. Yes, uh, I do. It, <laughs> it's, it's an amazing program, and I, I, um, I, I think we, had a, we need to get the word out to as many uh, young people as possible uh, to, to apply to that program. But yeah, there, there are going to be so many different opportunities for people of a wide range of backgrounds to, uh, to have a place in space in the future. Um, and so there will be artists in space. There'll be poets. There'll be um, you know, scientists and engineers. Uh, one day we'll need to, uh, to colonize Mars like Elon Musk wants to do. So we need a society in space, not just people that are like me in a fairly narrow band of uh, uh, professional backgrounds. Yeah, I, I do see space as a future to hold all types of uh, careers in, in one, because if we want to make space feels like home, there's a lot of stuff that happen at home. Um, so I definitely agree with your answer. The very last question is, what advice do you give to the younger generation who want to pursue a career in space, especially if the opportunities in the Middle East are limited? 
Well, you, 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 you may have heard that the United Arab Emirates is about to uh, launch its very first uh, astronauts. And of course, Saudi Arabia uh, has had an astronaut already fly. Uh, I believe there's a Syrian uh, cosmonaut uh, many, many uh, years ago. So there have been a, a limited number of astronauts uh, from the Middle East so far, but that's going to change. We're going to have astronauts from all over the world uh, with the opportunity to um, you know, fly on Virgin Galactic, on Blue Origin, on SpaceX, whether they're scientists, engineers, or simply uh, tourists who want to experience this life-changing uh, you know, kind of environment. So uh, if, if people want to pursue a career in space um, to maybe one day travel there, uh, I think the best preparation is to really become uh, very fluent in math, science, and engineering. The, the kind, the, I, I call those the, the languages of, uh, of space. Yeah. Uh, not just uh, Arabic, English, uh, whatever else, but um, to be able to be fluent in, in those technical languages as well. Coding is another great thing that mm -hmm. uh, is so important. Um, when we send crews one day to uh, the South Pole of the Moon or um, uh, to the Valles Marinaros uh, on Mars to, to go colonize these incredible places, we're going to need people to be jacks of all trades. So they need to be scientists, engineers, uh, maybe uh, healthcare, uh, but they also need to be machinists, uh, coders, uh, they need to be able to maintain, build, create, uh, whatever is necessary in these extraordinary environments. And so being well-versed in lots of different things, uh, I think would be a great preparation. But at, at the core, like I was saying earlier, to pursue things that you're really, really passionate about, and uh, it'll take you a long way. I'm going to steal that answer because I get this question almost every day from people who are 20 years or younger and they ask me how to go to space and we live in a, in a society that is just, we don't have that opportunity available, especially in Iraq where I'm from. And I do agree, but I think, I think there's any dream that seems difficult is the dream that you should be fighting for. Um, if you have that drive and you talk to people like yourself who are experienced in this field and just collecting all these answers to be able to answer the big questions on what is the pathway that I'm supposed to take. Awesome. Yes. <laughs> awesome. Well, I want to thank you for giving you, you gave me really awesome answers. I'm going to rewatch this video many, many times just to focus on every answer. You, I know you have a very busy schedule and the Arabian Stargazers, thank you. I'm sure a lot of people across the globe are really excited to have their questions answered personally by an astronaut. And I want to thank the Brooke Owens Fellowship for giving me this opportunity to meet you and talk to you. I cannot be more thankful to the founders, the co-founders who gave me this opportunity. Oh, that's awesome, Dan. I know it's been a thrill for me to, uh, to spend this time with you, and I hope uh, you know, your, your viewers uh, get something out of it. And um, the, the last thing I'd leave you with, is if folks are interested in any of my kind of crazy stories, I did write a book a couple of years ago called The Sky Below. So yes. check it out or um, follow me on my social media as well. But uh, um, I, I wish you all the, the greatest of continued success and uh, can't wait to see what happens uh, you know in your the next chapters of, of your your career so Very good luck. Excited for that thank you so much I'm going to put a link for your book um, probably I'll add the screenshot at the end of this video and have a swipe up so everybody can buy the book I'm sure many people will be interested to hear more about your experience cool thank you so bye. much Dr. Scott have a bye. good bye bye